I'm Chris Farrell, and this is On Watch. Welcome to On Watch, everybody, the Judicial Watch podcast, where we go behind the headlines to get to some news stories that don't get anywhere near enough coverage, where we try to recover lost history and explain the inexplicable. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time. Joining us today on the show is going to be Congressman Corey Mills from Florida. And before we get to discussions with Congressman Mills, what I want to really discuss is all the support, all the growing numbers that we have from you tuning in and watching or listening to this podcast. We really appreciate it. So please do subscribe, hit the bell to get notifications of new shows, give us a rating, email us, give us your input. We truly appreciate your support and the growth that this podcast has experienced. It's very encouraging and it's great to know so many people out there are interested in the work of Judicial Watch and the discussions we have with our excellent guests. And speaking of excellent guests, Corey Mills joins us. He is a congressman representing the seventh district of Florida. And for you folks that are trying to figure out where that is, it's basically just north of Cape Canaveral, upwards north to, I guess, the area around uh, uh, Daytona Beach, that area, and then over towards Orlando, that chunk kind of along the center coast of the Atlantic coast of Florida. Corey Mills uh, is a freshman congressman, just elected. Uh, more importantly, he's a husband and a father. He's a combat veteran. Uh, he's a guy who's actually gone out and created wealth. He's a businessman, an entrepreneur who ran a company, hired people, paid check, bet payroll every month. So he's got real world experience. And then in the government sector, he's an expert on foreign policy and security matters. And so we're very fortunate to have a real genuine American conservative join us on watch. Welcome, Congressman Corey Mills. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. What an honor. It's great to be that you join us. We appreciate it. I was reading your official bio, and there's a line that you and I share at the very bottom of your bio. You say something that I've said for decades now, and that is the oath that I took and the oath that you took, there was no expiration date on it. We took that That's oath exactly forever. Right. And uh, this is the 40th anniversary of my commissioning as a second lieutenant. Many moons ago, I was privileged enough to be sworn in by my dad, who was a World War II era infantry colonel who fought in the Philippines. And so uh, it's nice to have my dad pass that on to me. And it's great to talk to a, another guy who realizes that there's no uh, time expiration on your oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. Well, that's exactly right. And your father actually came from what I consider to be the greatest generation, which is that era within the World War II, who understood what it was to support and fight for American values, to fight for constitutionality, and to help to truly go against uh, evil. And, and, and so, uh, you know, just to talk to your point, Chris, you know, when I wore that uniform and I raised my hand and swore that oath, just because I took that uniform off doesn't mean that that oath expired. You know, my continuation of service, whether it was from the military or whether it was with the various agencies and Department of State, whether it was uh, as a business owner where we created a business that supported over 200 plus law enforcement departments across the country. So HRT and SRT and SWAT teams, um, you know, our family believes strongly in the idea that we should defend our men and women in blue, not defund our men and women in blue. And that's really important to us. And so, uh, you know, I think it's to a point, Chris, as you know, that we can no longer run on the battlefield and uh, do the same things we want to, but we want to still feel we're a part of the game. That's what it was when I built this business. It was about, being a part of helping to support the next generation of warfighter, sitting on the sidelines and being able to help with training and mentorship. Uh, we train uh, a lot of the different special operations teams out there and sniper and counter sniper operations and uh, modern uh, operations on urban terrain, uh, military operations on urban terrain, uh, CQB, things like this. So uh, really trying to just continue to, to support this nation and continue my service. You know, we're all born with that either that thread of servant leadership or we're not. That's what this is about, is continuing that servant leadership in Congress. Amen. I, I could not agree with you more. You know, you get a few gray, more gray hairs and your role or function changes. 
but, uh, and I've got a head full of gray hair, so I know what I'm talking about. The, uh, your role or your function changes, but at least uh, the support of the mission, the support and, de and defense of the Constitution is number one always. Uh, I want to get to something uh, that I know is near and dear to your heart. We're going to talk in a, just a, a couple of minutes about the Afghan withdrawal, but the, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the middle of the room uh, just in the, the last few hours, really, last day, is uh, yet another indictment by this clown Jack Smith, the so-called special counsel, the indictment of President Trump this time on January 6th related matters. So I want to get your, your impression, your feedback on this, uh, this latest assault on the Constitution. Well, as you know, Chris, and all your viewers, I mean, it was guaranteed that we were going to see another indictment every single time that the Biden crime family has evidence which is leveraged against them. Every time you see a new uh, committee hearing that brings a uh, a very credible informant into the room or witness to testimony, all of a sudden, mysteriously, there's a new indictment. You know, this indictment that they're trying to levy, which is nothing more than a political witch hunt to go after Biden's top political opponents, is really nothing more than uh, truly just election interference. And that, that's really what this boils down to, is that they're actually right. utilizing and weaponizing the DOJ to interfere in the elections to try and go after the top political opponent, which we know as President Trump. But further to that, I mean, let's look at the damaging facts here. You know that we have video of Joe Biden himself, who, you know, we call it quid pro quo, but I think we should change that, Chris, to quid pro Joe. Uh, you know, here he was trying to hold up over a billion dollars in aid unless they fired an actual uh, attorney general in Ukraine who was right. investigating Burisma, whom Devin Archer just testified that the Bidens were actually the brand buildup for the Burisma, and the Burisma would have actually have, have, have gone under as a business if it wasn't for the Bidens, not to mention the $10 million payment that had been made. You know, you couple that with what Tony Belins uh, Bobulinski said, where he confirmed right. that Joe Biden was, in fact, the big guy. You look at Schwerin, who had access to the business accounts of Hunter's firms and confirmed all the different shady dealings and wires, but also look at the multiple foreign partners that Hunter Biden and his father had threatened not to be able to try and support uh, essentially using economic coercion to get payments from things like the Chinese uh, executive energy company, Raymond Zhao. Um, you know, this is the most corrupt president in history. So when you see these things starting to surface and you already know that Joe Biden sitting at about a 35 to 38 percent approval rating, you know that they're going to utilize the Department of Justice. You know they're going to try and utilize the corrupt uh, Merrick Garland and others to come after President Trump to try and go ahead and steal the media headlines so that people don't look into what's actually starting to surface on the corrupt Biden family. Yeah, I mean, to me, the other part of this that really merits very close legal scrutiny is uh, the so-called legal theory or, or reasoning, the logic of uh, Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, because what he's done, the standard that he's now set is any public official who criticizes uh, election processes or in some way uh, challenges an outcome is now, I guess, a criminal. Um, you know, there's, if you go on Twitter or X, whatever they call it now, you can see all sorts of videos of various, you know, the usual Hollywood crowd of professional leftists out there, but even politicians, elected officials, who have complained about elections saying that they don't agree, or they think it was unfair, or they don't think so-and-so is legitimate. You had this phony running around in Georgia claiming that she was the governor for three or four years. So there's all these different political people exercising political speech. And according to Jack Smith, that's now a crime. So, I mean, they better get, go out and, and you know, get busloads of people that they need to prosecute at this point. Well, again, this is that two-tiered justice system that we all know about. We know that in 2016, we heard Hillary Clinton claiming that there was Russian interference in the elections. We know, as you mentioned, Correct. with Stacey Abrams and the Governor Kemp incident, that she never would uh, admit that the election was fair. Um, you know, but yet we're election deniers when we actually show proven affidavits that demonstrate that there was discrepancies in, in voter registration and voter turnout and voter counts. Uh, you know, the bottom line is, is that 
we're starting to see what you find in nations like China, what you find in Russia, whereby you can weaponize your own government against your political opponents and the opposition of party. And so we have to understand that this precedent that's being set must stop because they're actually creating a, a, a judicial system whereby you are now guilty until proven innocent. And it's just about launching indictments and investigations to try and tarnish your name. But here's the worst right. part, Chris. They're also putting gag orders against President Trump, knowing that he's running for a presidential election, knowing that on the debate stage that they're going to ask him questions that he won't be able to respond to, which looks like it's guilty by association, and thereby right. actually denying him. And in some cases, the gag order carries a heavier penalty than the actual indictment itself. So they know very well what they're doing here. And I can tell you, the Republican Party, the GOP, we were elected in as a majority to govern. And we keep saying that we're the majority, but we haven't started acting like the majority. We need to start utilizing the Judicial Committee's subcommittee of weaponization of federal government and start looking into what the actual reasoning for these investigations are, looking at defunding some of these actual investigations that are going on that are actually a witch hunt, and start looking at where the DOJ is actually trying to even do obstruction of justice until just recently – when it came to Devin Archer and his testimony, where they miraculously, and again, in police work, they call this a clue, where they miraculously start wanting to expedite his time for showing up for his sentencing so that he didn't actually need to testify before the committees. It is a... I, you know, let, me, let me... Let me I, I could not possibly agree with you anymore, but, and let me, let me grab onto that for a second. And uh, this may be an uncomfortable conversation for you, <laughs> but I got to ask the question. Uh, what in the world is the House doing on uh, six weeks of, uh, I don't want to say summer vacation, I'll, I'll say time back in the district. Uh, but, you know, how can uh, the illustrious leader, Mr. McCarthy, send everybody home when uh, you've got real work to do? At, at a minimum, you've got to uh, ask difficult questions. You've got to try to defund certain things. You need to apply pressure. You need to have committee hearings. And I, I also accept that you do need to go back to the district, check in, take care of local matters. I'm not dismissing that. But I, I, this August recess thing to me is crazy. This is the same thing where you had the FBI director, you finally forced him into coughing up the 1023 documents. And at the right at the point where you could have actually applied more pressure, they said, oh, okay, never mind, let it go. This doesn't make sense Although, to look, me. You look, you're, you're exactly right on this. I mean, look, the bottom line is when I was elected, and I was elected every 365 days a year to serve the American people, uh, right. my whole thing is, uh, have we done a lot? Yes, we have. You can look at H.R. 1, which is the Lower Cost Energy Act. You can look at H.R. 2, which is our Border Security Act. You can look at H.R. 5, our Parental Rights Bill. Uh, I was one that opposed the actual Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, I didn't think that it was fiscally responsible, in my opinion. I didn't think it went far enough as far as permit reform to help build out the America First agenda of helping American businesses. Uh, it didn't put the necessary threshold in place when it came to the actual expenditures per year. You know, I liked Limit Save Grow. That was at $1.471 trillion a year uh, with $1.2 trillion in rescissions. Um, we needed to defund multiple things to include uh, the Biden bailout for tuition, which was unconstitutional and ruled so by the actual Congress, but he's still trying right. other avenues. Right. Um, but, but you're right, Chris. I mean, look, the committees have gone forward. We've just passed the National Defense Authorization Act out of one of my committees, which is the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, there in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, we've completed all of our markups to include increasing sanctions against Iran and preventing the Biden administration from being able to re-enter the JCPOA nuclear deal. But right now, we need to be sitting in there day in and working the issues, reversing bad policy, ensuring that we're enforcing legislation, stopping the overreach and the weaponization of federal government against the American people and the American businesses. And like I told Matt Gates here recently when it was about Devin Archer and he said, we are requesting yeah. lawmakers to come back. I immediately uh, I responded that. and said, Matt, I'm ready to go. I'll be in D.C. tomorrow. And I flew in just in case they needed an extra member for the quorum because we are here to serve. And you know this all too well, Chris, when we're in uniform and you're serving in the government, you serve 24 hours a day. When my constituents call, we respond. When the American people need solutions, we respond. When we need to hold people accountable, we respond. That is the job of Congress. And so I'm 100% with you. And, and, and look, again, it's not my call, but at the end of the day, if they tell me to come back tomorrow, I'll be there tomorrow.
I just want to point out to our viewers and listeners that I agree with Congressman Mills 100%. Uh, I'm just trying to highlight for our listeners and our viewers' consideration that they may wish to communicate with the illustrious Speaker of the House, Mr. McCarthy, and tell them that, you know what, Jack Smith and company have not taken off six weeks. Uh, you know, the Biden uh, Justice Department, the Biden State Department, uh, they're not taking off. I guarantee you they are busily at work dreaming up ways to destroy the country. They've got a militant leftist agenda, and unless there is an active ongoing opposition on the part of conservatives to try to check uh, what they're doing, uh, we're frittering away opportunities to, to exercise the majority in the House. And it's enormously frustrating to me, personally speaking. And let me tell you, there's, if you guys are not in session and asking questions, there's no government accountability. So all that does is it means I have more work at Judicial Watch. <laughs> I've got more things to do because you, because you guys aren't. <laughs> well, I will preface with this, Chris. We, we are still technically working, just not in session. So one of the things, as an example, I have today at 3.30, uh, with some of my colleagues to include uh, Congressman Ken Buck, as we have an AUMF working group where we're looking to repeal uh, the horribly abused uh, authorization of mil use of military Good. force that's been uh, abused since 0102. Um, so we are still having working group sessions. We are still having committee right, uh, Zoom meetings while we're in, this, while we're in, in uh, uh, recession. Um, but we're also working our district at the same time to ensure that we're dealing with the issues that you know yeah. hit home. So yeah, yeah, um, I mean, I, I get kind it. Of balancing I, with both I, I I get it, and I and I agree with what you're saying. And and I know that there are separate meetings offline, and I, there is definitely a, a totally legitimate, valid reason to connect with the people in your district and, and take care of problems there, no doubt. Uh, I just uh, I just caution uh, the leadership not to fritter away opportunities. I, I want to turn, if we can now, to talk about something that you've been working on, and that has to do with the release of classified information related to the Afghan withdrawal. Uh, that was a disaster on the part of the Biden administration uh, what what don't we know that we need to find out about? Tell us about it. Well, the bottom line is, is that uh, for many of the viewers who aren't familiar with me, I'm actually the only member of Congress uh, who went over and actually con we conducted the very first successful overland rescue of Americans, a mother and three children out of Congressman Ronnie Jackson's district from Amarillo, Texas. And so when I look at, you know, the discussions I've had with the 13 families, uh, for the August 26th incident that cost 13 heroes, 13 new Gold Star families, which in my, I, I can tell you it was a very preventable incident. When I look at the political yep. optics over military strategy that was utilized by the Biden administration and his ignoring of his generals, officers who had told him, as well as for these 23 diplomats who signed this dissent cable saying that this would actually end in catastrophe, he ignored those. And when you ignore that as commander in chief and you put Americans husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, uh, sons and daughters at risk, and they lose their lives because of a decision that you've made, there needs to be accountability for that. I hold this accountability. I just, I, I just, let, me, let, me, let me just interrupt you for a second, because uh, I, I want our viewers and listeners to appreciate this. So there was a dissent cable, and maybe describe what that is, and, and who are these? You said there's 26... Foreign service officers? And this, this is one of the hearings that we just recently had where we talked to the woman who is responsible in the State Department for filing the dissent cables. We asked her, and she's been with the, with the State Department for over 16 plus years. We asked her, how many of these dissent cables do they get per year? She said, somewhere between three to five. I said, of those dissent cables, what is the average number of people who are signatories on that dissent cable? She said, one to two. I said, so let me get this straight. You got a dissent cable with over 23. Department of State officials who are writing you, warning you of what may happen if you go forward to the current strategy, and that wasn't flagged to the Secretary of State or to the Commander-in-Chief that this is a big issue, we've never seen this before? Well, no, we didn't feel that it was necessary, and we responded in a timely manner. And if I could just interrupt again, just so our, our audience appreciates this. In the State Department, 
they have a means of communicating official government policy, directions, instructions, et cetera. And that makes perfect sense. Everybody gets that. Headquarters talks to the field, tells them what they want to have done. The State Department years and years ago set up what they call this dissent cable or dissent channel, which was a way to allow senior officials to officially object, to say, hey, look, I understand our policy is A, B, and C. I get it. But listen, I'm on the ground. I'm doing this for a living. I'm getting my hands dirty. And I'm telling you, you're wrong. We need to do X, Y, and Z, and not A, B, and C. And so the State Department, a little intellectual honesty here, they actually opened a channel or created this way for people to say, hey, wait a minute, you're screwing up. You got to take a second look at this. And it's quite extraordinary. There isn't a lot of this in government, but the State Department has done this. And what Congressman Mills is talking about is that there's, there's 23 people who signed on to this cable going back to headquarters saying, whoa, what the hell are you doing? And so th I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to give magnification to this of, of what, a, what a big deal this is. And so th this person uh, just told you, Congressman, that they, they had never seen anything like this before. Is that right? Well, that's exactly right. And the sad part is that they had gone forward with this operation. This uh, descent cable came out uh, around the uh, end of June, July time frame. We asked to see the descent cable from the State Department. They first denied us the right to see it, which is not permissible. And we then requested again. They gave us a version later that was a highly, um, I would say, redacted and summary version, but not the actual cable itself. Right. And it literally took us to, to issue and, and to Chairman McCall of the House Foreign Affairs Committee's uh, credit. He actually had to subpoena the Secretary of State because of these, and we were going to hold him in contempt on the floor if he didn't provide it. And at that point, they finally allowed the uh, dissent cables to be released to members of Congress who were on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. But then they classified it at a level that would be just above the ability to release for the American people. I find that unacceptable. And at minimum, those 13 Gold Star families should have a right to read what was the impact and decision making that went into the death of their loved ones. And so we're now fighting to actually uh, uh, essentially declassify areas of this to redact the names of individuals, but redact the actual information that shows that there was warning provided if they went forward with the uh, strategy, if, they, if you want to call it strategy, that resulted in the loss of 13 lives. And again, I, I just for the listeners, Chris, you know, we're, we're talking about something that was absolutely preventable. We had Bagram Air Base that we could have been launching from that had a complete standoff distance. I'd spent a lot of time. Look, in my career, I've spent over seven years in Iraq, over three years in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Pakistan, uh, northern Somalia. I was blown up twice in 2006. Um, I have been to Bagram many times. We could have housed 40,000 plus people, done the biometrics, done the medical screening, helped to support our SIVs for our uh, interpreters and translators who had been with us for 20 plus years fighting this fight. And we could have done this in a very strategic manner, not to mention the fact that you always get your civilians and the NEO out before you actually withdraw your military. Never have we pulled our military before we've pulled our civilians. And so everything about this was strategically done wrong and only for political optic purposes. And that right there in itself is where the accountability needs to be held because this isn't like we were doing something that was by protocol or by doctrine and something went bad. That's understood in the military. And we can do an AAR or an after action review when that happens. This was out of character, out of doctrine, and not built on military strategy. And that's where accountability has to be held. And I think that it has to be held at Lloyd Austin, at Secretary Blinken, and at the Commander-in-Chief themselves. And they need to either be removed, they need to dismiss themselves, uh, or they need to be impeached. So why in the world would we ever, ever give up Bagram Air Base? Well, to be honest with you, Chris, the reason they gave it up is because China wanted Bagram. They immediately went in there and flipped the lights on. But what we also left in Afghanistan was $1.1 trillion in lithium. We left gold mines, minerals, and all of these other things that are actually highly beneficial to the Chinese, to the renewable energy supply. And 
this is where we look at, again, tying in our first point, which is the compromise administration that we have under Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. But here's the worst part, Chris. When they handed over Bagram and they took over HPI, which is the commercial airspace, remember the message they were first sending out. They were saying, all right, we're going to be out of here by November or by September 11th. Well, the reality is that they started this evacuation way earlier than that in the late parts of August. Now, a lot of Americans had return trips, whether it was via Emirates or via uh, Ariana or Cam Air or Fly Dubai. There was a lot of commercial carriers who were flying out there that Americans were booked on. The minute that the Department of State and the Department of Defense takes over HKI, the commercial airspace, it automatically shuts down commercial carriers. That was in part why people were actually entrapped in America or right. in, in Afghanistan. Right. So you literally entrapped these Americans, then you refused to get all of them out, and then you did standoff business on the outside of the protective barriers that cost 13 members while ignoring credible intel reports that came in and the descent cables. This is more than just a willful negligence or dereliction of duty. This was a absolutely, we don't care what happens, we're going to get people out for political optics, and that now has cost 13 Gold Star families multiple interpreters who have been methodically hunted down and killed by the Taliban, ISIS Corps, San Haqqani, who we left billions of dollars in defense equipment for, and also other Americans that we had to actually get out as civilians because the government failed to do their jobs. It is probably, uh, well, let's just, I'll put it this way, in, in the category of foreign policy and national defense or security, it is the greatest failure so far of the Biden administration. I'm not putting it past them to do something even worse, but, uh, and you know, right out of the gate practically, uh, the first summer of their administration, Biden and company just folded. I mean, this is a national disgrace on so many levels. So I, you know, I wish you all the best to dig out every little gruesome detail. Well, and Chris, you remember why we came? Remember why we went to Afghanistan? We went there to stop it from being a safe haven of terror. Right. What we actually turned it into was an actual safer place for terrorism yeah. to thrive. Not to mention twenty years of training. Not to mention millions of dollars in cash. Not to mention billions of dollars in helicopters and defense articles and machine guns and high explosives and MRAPs. We literally created a a better trained, better equipped terrorist organization with ISIS Khorasan, with the Akhani Network and the Taliban and cost American lives. You know, all that blood, sweat, tears, treasure, lives, 20 year investment thrown away. Like this a, is the uh, problem of the suits, not the boots, Chris. And I want everyone who served in Afghanistan to hold your head up. I want you to know that what you did was right, that you fought just warfare, that you were following orders, that you fought proudly and honorably, and that this failure is not on you. This is on the suits, not the boots. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Before we wrap up, I want to give you uh, the last word. If there's something that you want to talk about or some topic we need to cover, uh, let me pitch it to you now, and then uh, I'll uh, I'll give you my closing thoughts, and we'll wrap up. Well, you know, my only thing, Chris, is that the American people are awake, not woke. And we have to understand that the fate, things that we're facing right now, it's not enough. It's not fecklessness by this Biden administration. It's intentional. They're doing everything they can to weaken us militarily, economically, and diplomatically to make us exposed and vulnerable to our greatest existential threat, which is China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, who have a geopolitical alignment. We have to understand that our recruitment deficit right now is at 25,000 plus for our armed forces, not to mention the 8,400 who are unconstitutionally purged for the COVID vaccine. It puts us at over three, there were 30,000, which is three military divisions short in our recruitment. And if you look at the recent Gallup right. poll, it shows that the confidence by the American people in our military is at an all time low for the last two decades. We have to start prioritizing what it is to have proper defense strategy. What we have to do is start securing our borders, helping the America first agenda by building up the industrial base. The American people have to be civically engaged and remember that our constitution starts out with we the people, not we the government. We cannot be the silent majority any longer. And if you're not in the Florida 7th district, but you believe in constitutionality, you believe in American values, you believe in protecting our children, securing our borders, and making sure we're not being the world's police, then I am your representative of Congress and I'll continue to fight for you. That is an excellent, succinct closing statement. I can tell you, 
the Biden administration is all about, uh, you know, uh, drag shows on Air Force bases and uh, trying to penalize uh, NATO allies who don't agree with their radical uh, gender ideology. Uh, it's, we are in the midst of, a, it's a slow motion sort of Bolshevik revolution that we're experiencing. And you can look across the economy, the Justice uh, Administration, the Justice Department, uh, public policy out of the Biden administration in virtually every segment of, the, of public life. Uh, it is a radical, really sick leftist approach uh, that's destroying our country. And so, uh, as the congressman just said, you know, he's on your side. If you support the things that Judicial Watch is all about, uh, and you listen to what he just said with regard to what he supports and defends, I encourage you to follow Congressman Corey Mills on his website and the Congress, his Twitter feed, those sorts of things. Um, Congressman, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate your time and all the hard work you're doing. Thank you, Chris. I'm Chris Farrell on Watch.